Um, and as an indigenous woman, I start showing you my family. Um, this is the Mochica side of my family, my dad's side. And um, although my mom was Quechua, I truly identified a lot more with the Mochica. And if you can see them, um, I resemble a lot them. So these are photos from the area of Puerto Eten in the 1900s. We were lucky enough to get some photos from the coastal groups. And I am doing this as a gesture of uh, respect from my land, my, my part of the world to your part of the world. No? The Mochica territory was invaded because the coast was largely invaded by um, Western civilization. So the language, uh, uh, the last speakers were around uh, probably 1910. There are now efforts to revitalize the Mochica language, but uh, they are very limited. Okay, so I am going to start with my presentation. I um, I, the first part that I would like to talk to is about the languages in danger. The, the communities, the people that speak those languages are and have been experiencing such uh, danger in their lives too. Letting go of one's language and not allowing the new generations to inherit our language uh, patrimony entails not only a terrible suffering but it means relinquishing to our voices, you know? My, my, the kind of work that I do is different than what other linguists do, which is I, I am interested in the languages that are endangered, but more than anything, I am interested in the communities, in the people, in the human side of these losses. It's not only, to me, it's not, it's not enough to look at the languages, but to basically look in, at, in the same way to the people that speak the languages. Because if the languages are wounded, if the languages are discriminated, the people that speak the languages go through tremendous amount mm. of pain. And sometimes I think the movements of endangered languages around the world, even within the UN, you know, within the United Nations, sometimes focus too much on the language per se, not thinking about the people that speak the languages. Okay, so, and my work is exactly what I am expressing, no? According to the Foundation for Endangered Languages, there are approximately 6,000 to 7,000 living languages today. Of these, 10 major languages constitute the native tongues of almost half of the world's population. While not all the remaining languages can be considered endangered, over half of them are. What is this telling us? This is telling us that we have mainly 10 languages that are considered the majority in English, Spanish, and we can go, no? Mandarin, there are different ways to measure that. But then the other, all the other languages are, are placed in a second place, like, um, like if they are not as important, no? And we sociolinguists see this fact as the moment in which there is this asymmetrical relationship, okay? This lack of equilibrium in which some languages are thought to be the civilized, the one who have writing system, the one who are official. And the other ones are even thought as not languages. If your language is not understood as a real language, then the people that speak that language are immediately discriminated. And that is something that has happened, I think, around the world, but it is something that comes from our own experience. And I think from my personal experience too, because my mother 
as a speaker of Quechua, we growing up in an urban setting, we went through a lot, we suffered a lot. So when I talk about this, I am not talking of a subject matter that I am studying or I am observing. This is something very personal to me. Around a quarter of the world's languages have fewer than a thousand remaining speakers right now. And linguists generally agree in estimating that the extinction within the next century of at least 33,000 of the 6,000 or 7,000 languages listed by ethnologue, or nearly half of those 7,000 are virtually guaranteed under, uh, not guaranteed under the present circumstances. The threat of extinction does affect a vastly greater proportion of the world languages and as the same as biological species, no? Um, what I see when I read this is the human suffering behind having to let go of your languages. Having a family, like what happened to me, grand, my grandmother was basically, on my mother's side, was, she was basically monolingual Quechua speaker. And when I was growing up, I was walking out, I, I was being walked out of my native language. So there was a gap in communication there. No one is going to ever return that to me. So if we look at this phenomenon outside of the numbers, no, of the statistics, what I see is a human tragedy behind this. So language loss is the loss of contact among you know, families, among communities. And that's why for me, it is very important to understand language rights as human rights. When a language dies, a world dies with it in the sense that a community's connection with its past traditions and its base of specific knowledge are typically lost as the vehicle linking people to that knowledge is abandoned. Okay, let me keep on. These are, this is a map of language activists helping revitalize what I call wounded languages. Okay, and those wounded languages are also reflecting on wounded communities. People don't talk about the pain of losing the language, but the pain is there, you know, the pain is there. I see it every day in, with students here at the university that I am associated with, the denial of them to be able to use their mother tongue, the shame that is, that goes together with this language, no? Uh, I don't know if you're, you're here, but you should probably be. <laughs> this is a map that the UN sent me. Mm -hmm. uh, now, my second point is why is language so important? <laughs> Languages are a critical part of identity, necessary not only for communication, but also for transmitting epistemic resources ways of living and knowing. Even emotions, how do you process emotions? Okay, so language is such an important part of a person. And for a society to impose a language that is not, for example, mine or, or my mother's and, and overtly or Sublimin, subliminally or directly or indirectly tell you that your language is no good, that your language is uh, primitive, that your language is not even a language, is what is that telling you about who you are and your background? Yeah. Okay. 
there, there are a few, I participated in, at Columbia University in 2018 with Elsa Stapanopoulos, that you should be in contact with her. She is a professor at Columbia University. She's Greek, but she worked at the UN for many years. Global Justice for Indigenous Language, a symposium. Um, I think we came up with a lot of recommendations. And I think it's important to be in contact with groups like that because uh, everyone is very open to other, you know, participants. Language as a territory, language in a dialogue with nature. Efforts to safeguard languages at risk are many times associated to the languages per se. What I propose is that these efforts will be associated and directed to safeguard peaceful existence of the speakers of those languages. Support to languages, but above all, we support the communities of speakers. Respect for the languages should be immediately associated to respect for the ones who speak those languages. This is part of my activism. And I think, ALM, you probably have seen this in my language rights group. This has caught the attention of a lot of people because I think it resonates with people across the world. Okay. I also work a lot on a critique of linguistic discrimination, looking at the dignity and equality of all languages. Mm -hmm. How can millions of speakers, I mean, for example, in my case, I grew up in, by, in a bilingual household where the language of my mother had to be hidden completely. The, the door outside the house, we had to hide that we had any connection to her language. So our bilingualism and her bilingualism, who was, she was dominant, we call that dominant in Quechua, less dominant in Spanish. I was growing up dominant in Spanish. We had to hide that bilingualism. So it's like this perception that that's not even a bilingual situation. Why? Because one language is considered high and the other one low. No? That was quite, that was all of those uh, paradigms have been proposed and studied a lot by Dr. Joshua Fishman. I don't know if you are um, aware of his work, Joshua Fishman. I was his assistant at New York University. No? So let me read you here. How come millions of speakers, bilingual and monolingual, could be made invisible? Okay. And then these terms that I use a lot, language shame. I understand, no one has to explain to me what language shame means because I lived it a lot in my life, even as a child. You know, you as a child, you just sort of act automatically. That should not be the norm, but unfortunately it is. Language pain. Language pain is something that I am working a lot now here in Peru because I see people that don't speak the language feel a lot of pain because there is guilt. Oh, I don't speak Quechua. But the people that speak Quechua feel shame because they do speak it. So we are in this situation in which there is, we have to find some resolution to that, you see? Uh, human suffering, um, language suppression, and in school, our children, uh, the, uh, the children that speak the Amazonian languages, the Quechuas, the Quechua languages, uh, we are all only evaluated on what they call our deficits. So we are the population that have uh, that is evaluated as a deficit, as a population with a deficit, because we don't speak Spanish, 
because we don't speak Spanish well, because our language uh, doesn't have writing system. You know, we are never evaluated on the on the strengths that we but that what that we that we bring to the school in any I mean elementary, primary, or at the university level, no? This is a little bit of the, a description of the Quechua. Quechua is a linguistic family spoken by around 12 million in Peru, Bolivia, Ecuador. In Ecuador, it's called Quechua. In Colombia, it's called Ingano, Inga. And in the north of Chile and in Argentina also, it's called La Quechua. An official language in Peru, historically largely discriminated. No? Uh, we are a lot in Peru that speak the language. Uh, I talk about this sometimes. I have a special presentation of this that it's very strange to have so many speaking, so many millions speaking the language, but we have to be hidden. So it's, it's like a constant contradiction. No? Now the Maya family also, I would like to um, mention it. Maya is also a family of language spoken by around 7 million in Guatemala and also spoken in Mexico in the peninsula of Yucatan. When you go to uh, Cancun, that's a Maya, Maya area. It's also spoken in Belize, in Western Honduras and in El Salvador. It is also important as a transnational refugee and immigrant language spoken in the United States and in Canada. Uh, in Guatemala, there are 22 Mayan languages. And in Mexico, um, there are a number of them, including, including um, Celtal, Tzotzil. Um, the Maya are very, very fascinating. A lot of um, language defenders, very interesting. These are the maps, the Aymara language in, this is Bolivia, you see Bolivia, Peru, spoken by 2.5 million. This is the, the map of South America. This is Peru, Bolivia, Ecuador. See all of this, Quechua, and this is Aymara. And this is Mexico. I love Mexico because I think indigenous people there have been able to um, acquire, uh, let's say, a formal education in terms of Mexican values, let's say, Western education. So you will, it's the only country in which I find uh, engineers who are Maya, um, a lot of doctor, uh, PhDs in linguistics, in education, in Mexico, you, you can claim to be urban and you can still claim your identity. In Peru, once you move urban, no more Quechua, you have to become a regular Peruvian. And look at all of the languages in Mexico. Wonderful, wonderful place. Um, Nahuatl, which was the language of the Aztecs, is spoken in the north, around 2 million, 2 million Aztec um, I work with a lot of the, they also have a lot of poets in different languages, very nice. In Peru, Yacta Simichiscuna, this is Quechua, 48 languages being 47 indigenous and Spanish is 48. And these are other languages of the Amazonian. I'm working a lot with the Amazonian. Let me tell you, a lot of them have died in the COVID, no? This is what I usually uh, use as my seal, protect languages, protect peoples. A ver, from the Quechua experience, um, in 2010, uh, 2006, these two Quechua speakers were elected as Congress people. She is Ilaria Supa and she is Maria Sumire. I came from New York. I was studying at New York University. I came to work with both. And both of them are the ones who were able to push the language rights um, legislation, 
that we successfully got approved. And the, the, they are the ones that are, that were, um, you know, the ones who had the 48 languages approved in, um, in Congress. That's me, this is Fernande Barren, the person I was talking to you about. He's now the, um, in charge of minority languages at UN Geneva. He came all the way from there to help us. This is Fernand and um, his presence was very important <laughs> because, you know, he's a white man, he spoke French and he, he was a professor, but we are Indians. If I say that, if I talk about this, they don't care. But if he did, then <laughs> if he spoke, then they listened to him. Some of the theoretical considerations that I, I work on. Um, Number one, we need to understand, this is a sociolinguistic based um, uh, concept. No? We need to understand the asymmetrical relationships of languages in contact, okay? It's not the same to talk about um, a bilingual situation between Spanish and Quechua than it is between Spanish, for example, and English, no? It's, we need to talk about how it's, it's, it's something that I develop a lot. The inequality in those relationships take you to ultimately the erasure, okay? Once you erase the language, you erase part of a, a fundamental part of the identity of the person. And that's, I think, probably the case with you and the situation of the last, Erasure, erasure, erasure. And we, what we do is resist, resist, resist. Sometimes we resist not with the language, but with the being, you know? Then these are connected to what we call policies of language extermination. And what Tobes Kudnap Kangas, I don't know if you know her, if you don't, you should follow her. She calls linguistic genocide. She has a lot of production on linguistic genocide, which bring us to language prejudice, language hierarchies. So this hierarchy of having um, some languages being the official and the idea is, okay, you speak this language and you forget about everything else that, that bring us to the study of language hierarchies and linguistic violence, language discrimination, as institutionalized and outside of formal institutions, no? Um, right now, there is a lot of fight for the inclusion of indigenous languages in education, but to my view, really what they do is they just try to copy what has been done in other parts of the place. They photocopy and they bring it here. It doesn't work. And the coin, uh, the term linguicism, which is like racism, linguicism was coined by Tobes Kutnap Kangas, Dr. Tobes Kutnap Kangas, and it has to do with discrimination due to language. More, the relationship within language and emotions, language shame, language pain, human suffering due to language suppression, and again, when you go to school, when you enter the system, you are always evaluated on deficit. Now, again, the theory of, of Vogan, language and resistance. Some communities around the world have made it very symbolic to resist through language. And that is something that I go around in the world observing. Uh, what Dr. Fishman proposed, and Fishman is the father of, of sociolinguistics, at least in the United States. He passed away in 2015, and he was like a father to me. I spent many years working with him, assisting him. No? What uh, Fishman says is that there is a possibility to change this decline by a phenomenon called language shift and then reverse, reverse this language shift that, the, that, sh that pushes the language to go in a loss, no? And he created um, um, 
a, a paradigm where he talks about the intergenerational transmission, no? It's, the, it's Fishman's model to reviving uh, threatened lang or sleeping, sleeping languages, no? And making them uh, uh, sustainable. Uh, if the language is not transmitted, it doesn't matter how much do you, for example, we just saw the, the, the rock, that song that I play, play that we, you saw, uh, those, that group of people, most of them have, they still have Quechua as their, as their language one. However, if they are not transmitting that to their children, N no rock and blues in Quechua, it doesn't make any, it doesn't affect. The language is going to die. So we have this, all of this terminology was created by Joshua Fishman, language laws. How do we maintain the language? And this is the one that I like more, language loyalty. Some groups around the world make it very strong to be loyal to their language. And then what we talk a lot about, and it's been talked a lot about around the world, language revitalization and language revival. Some of the authors working on this terminology is, is Fishman, who he's no longer with us, Leonor Grenoble, Tsunoda, Gillette Zuckerman. Gillette, this is a good friend. He talks about the fact that he calls, he doesn't, call the languages that are losing uh, dead languages, but he calls them sleeping beauties, meaning that they could come back to life if the love of the speakers bring them to life. David Crystal and Nancy Dorian. This is my seal also, language rights. And coming from a Quechua background, this is the dancer that you saw in the in the video you know he's very symbolic to us of the revival and the resistance of the spirit of quechua speaking the languages even in spite of horrendous discrimination no and um placing we place a lot that's at, at least how i see it we we are not a, a written culture as writing in the alphabetic system but I think we have been, quote, writing, unquote, with our dances, with our sing songs, and especially with our weaving tapestry. There are lots of coding there, you know, that we are now trying to bring to the table to talk about how could we include all of this on an equal to equal basis in the school setting. It's an epistemological fight and I don't know how we're going to do, but I'll do what I can. So this dancer is very symbolic because the, the day that the dancer stops to dance, that we don't have new dancers, then it will be like if 1000 libraries are burned. This is something that is going on. Uh, young people are taking the cities. This is not in the city of Lima, but in Cusco, where Machu Picchu is. Uh, they are using poetry and appropriating themselves of the alphabetic writing to write it, to write in the language. I think the idea is not to say that we don't want to write, but to the contrary, that if writing is something we can add, it's important, but not subtract. You know, not say, oh, we are, you know, the weavings are not important, but to place weaving and other, you know, of our elements at the same level of writing. If colonial conquest, in colonial conquest, language did to the mind what the sword did to the bodies of the colonized. This is, this was my professor to, um, Gugi Wationgo, he's uh, an African Kenyan from Kenya. 
I've been trained by very anti-colonial people <laughs> in my life. Why are our languages at risk? Now, I'm going to put you in contact with what is going on right now because I am a person who's a contemporary Quechua and I am very interested uh, on what other contemporary indigenous people are doing right now. This is Elena Yasnaya. She's a very important language rights advocate. She's from Ayutle Mije background in Mexico. She came out with this, with this phrase, our languages don't die out. They are killed off, okay? And the other one is someone from uh, the Ojibwe nation in Canada that came up with this. I really would love to see the dialogue around indigenous language and uh, languages shift from languages dying off to languages being killed. We are not letting them die off. We are denied the resources to be able to revitalize them after they were intentionally injured through colonialism. These are two young people. They don't know each other. One is in Canada, the other one is in Mexico, but look at how our thoughts, our ideas are coming through in the same road. This is, um, she's very powerful. Her name is, um, and she's the first one who took center stage in uh, speaking totally in her native language, Mije, at the um, Congress uh, in Mexico. No? You can take a look at her. Uh, the next uh, point I would like to make is the sacred relationship between language and territory. For us, Mother Earth has a narrative. And we need to be in tune with this narrative. The only way to tune with this narrative is to understand that language is territory. It's not only territory because we are standing on it, but it's territory within, internally. When you speak your language, you, have, you feel that you are in control of your place. Okay, and territory is a big situation for us in Latin America and I think around the world. Because, um, for example, in the Amazon, because of uh, oil and because of different kind of uh, mines that they are looking for with metals, copper, you know, lithium right now, our territories are being invaded. So here I am putting, when we are removed and we are relocated or displaced, we lose contact with our territory. Remember, our languages were born of the relationship between us and our, envi and our environment. Land, language, territory, nature are all closely tied to the creation and the maintenance of our languages and our traditional knowledge. So, as a mirror of what I see here, not only in Peru, in Mexico, in many other, even in the US, I emphasize a lot of this. How is our language, our word, going to flourish in a territory that is taken away from us? Note to the removal of communities from homeland territories. As I am speaking now, so many people are being relocated. And this doesn't come up in the media, but the abuse is terrible. And since I have worked a lot on language policies, it's not easy to work on language policies and coming up to agreements with the states because the states have a tradition of having control over the imposition of one language for centuries. So one has to truly act very carefully, not to lose the dialogue, but to insist on 
the fact that the languages cannot be made so that language are stored in libraries or in institutes of languages um, in, or in institutes, no? Languages are their speaker's creation. Languages are inseparable from homeland territory. One cannot support the languages safekeeping and the, at the same time violently remove their speakers from their home grounds. Uh, let me pass this. This is also something that we face a lot. What you see here are um, indigenous people in Brazil where they have a terrible time with Bolsonaro. I've seen them, let me tell you, some of them are, are the brink of extinction after COVID-19. Um, it's been my sad privilege to be in contact with many of them. And we find that many times indigenous people in a situation like the tribes in Brazil are visited by anthropologists, linguists, they are doing documentation, videotaping them, but this is what the answer is. It is racism when you say you love indigenous languages and look down on their speakers. So now we are, we are working on a document so that we will request for our complete permission and co to be co-authors in anything they write about us. This is some more of Elena the Mije, a Mexican, um, she's a good friend. Languages are important. However, much more important are the speakers of these languages. Languages die because their speakers are discriminated, excluded, and violently treated to let go of their mother tongues. Mm. Okay, I have in the last few years been even a uh, consultant to the Ministry of Culture and also to the Ministry here in, in terms of trying to, since I worked on the approval of the, of the language law, no? But what I see truly is that, um, what I see is that they want to accommodate everything according to their needs, no? For example, Quechua is usually assigned a modern nationality. They say Quechua is Peruvian, a language that has been in this territory for more than 5,000 years cannot be Peruvian, nor Equatorian, nor Bolivian. You know? language, Quechua is in itself, has its own, its own uh, background, you know? So this, tendency to say that it's Peruvian is something that I really, and we, we rejected, no? but many people have to be quiet. And this is another response to this negotiation of the so-called policies of inclusion that look very good on the, on the website of the state, or it looks very good on the videos, but indigenous people are allowed to be powerful in things that do not place, do not put at risk the social structure. This is where we are right now, okay? We are very good to go and be on the postcard of the folk, uh, folkloric dances, or when they have expo, expo crafts to sell, no? But do you believe that Machu Picchu, you probably are aware of Machu Picchu, no? No indigenous people can go into Machu Picchu, not even the people that live around Machu Picchu because it costs $30 to go in. So as a summary now, I find that language is a human capital. Bilingualism and multilingualism in any language should be uh, understood as, as something that is a resource not as something that is a problem. The territory is important in terms of the language. Claiming the territory is important because it's, it, it also safeguards biodiversity for all. And then the last part is 
to look at language defense as the defense of the epistemologies. What is the defense of the cognition and the local knowledge, okay? Which has resisted, I don't even know, we've lost so much. I think so many communities, we've lost so much. And that's why it's important to look at this and to, if, if there is going to be a language policy proposal for any language or any community in the world, it has to be well thought. This is, um, these are some of the new leaders that are coming up from down up because she is Gladys Sulsul. She's Kiche from uh, Guatemala. This is Sandra Shinikovac. She's only 24. Really very brave girl. I, I met her in La Habana in 2018. And this is Aura Cumes. Aura Cumes talks about the epistemologies of domination and what she calls new and old colonialism. You know, sometimes we talk about colonialism thinking that it's, it's past, that it, but there's a new way of colonizers. And this new way of colonizers is to allowing us to, to say that our languages are beautiful, are wonderful, but, but you know, they have to be spoken outside of power far away. No, so first they hated us. We were here, and now they're trying to put us here. But there is never an equal to equal. Quechua and Maya are languages as any other language in the world that should be treated equally. You know, and we will develop writing system in alphabetic. We will. There things happening. This is Sandra. I, I have a lot of connection with her. She talks about how the, the, the government of Guatemala take over their culture and tries, try to control it. This is another quote from this meet gathering at Global Justice for Indigenous Languages, the symposiums that we have. Efforts to build indigenous education can use a framework that has come to be known as epistemologies of the South, meaning South as the global South, the people who are always placed in the subaltern. And there is this North that speak all of these beautiful colonial languages and there are other people that should not be even counted. No? Respect for indigenous cognitive styles, respect for indigenous forms of language and cultural transmission or local literacies, all in spirit of autonomy and sovereignty. This is more on language and epistemologies, um, ways of knowing, ways of thinking, ways of feeling, rationality of belief, intuitive knowledge, dialogue with elements of nature, rain, wind, trees, mountains. People think that that is sort of, um, how can I say? In Latin America, we have something that it's called indigenous, um, no, magical realism. But for us, there is an author called um, Daniel Walcott. He calls that indigenous realism. For us, mountains are like people, Plants are like people, rivers are like people. They are not less, you know. Oh my God, that's something with my, hold on. Okay, um, that's what we call native epistems grounded on native traditional knowledge. Uh, as an educator, working with bilingual populations who are exposed to profoundly asymmetrical relationships, I recognize that the issue is complex and the policies to achieve linguistic justice are extremely difficult to implement. At, at the same time, I recognize its urgency 
and extra no, extraordinary importance. The praxis of our language policy affects us on our deepest and most essential level. It affects us as a nation and as individuals. I think Latin, Latin American nations are struggling to decide what kind of societies they want to be. Language is power. Controlling people's language is one way that those in power maintain control over others. As we watch the development of language policy in Peru or in indigenous Latin America, we are also watching the perseverance of ancestral meanings and our future. This is some of the things that I have proposed. There are a group of Amazonian people who came and live in the city of Lima now, tremendous discrimination for them. But what they did with the help of some artists was to transfer the, um, the uh, drawings from their clothing into, uh, into a poster, into a wall. Mm -hmm. So this is what is going on in Lima right now. This is, this is our, our response. It's only five minutes. This is what I call semiotic landscape. Semiotic landscape, yours is banal. That's Ophelia. I mean, este, yeah, a friend. These are other groups. I'm just going to go fast. This is a group of um, Bu, bir grup Bolivia from Bolivia. Bolivia. Mm -hmm. Bolivia this is rap, rap mm -hmm. in Aymara. Look, this is he uses this is his mother, so they use a lot of Bu, personal Bu. narrative, okay, which is a way to erase the shame. No, these are a lot of rap. Utanç duyulmasının konusunda e, farkındalık yaratmak için. Yeah. Maya, this is um, this is a trilingual from uh, Spanish, Mixteco, and English. Perhaps in Cuicateco, uh, Maya, all over. Young people are coming out and doing rap. These are um, a book by the UN looking at the, the life of young people. Uh, more on what's going on. This is my university, the first uh, um, bachelor's degree that was written in Quechua by this lady. We had to wait like 500 years to, for the language to be approved to be uh, accepted as a, as a thesis. No? This is Quechua written. There are lots of problems with the writing of Quechua because we have a lot of varieties. These are a group of people in, in uh, Zapotec who have created um, not only books in Zapotec, but also comic, see? Spider-Man uh, has a voice in, in Zapotec. <laughs> Very popular with the kids. Um, also writing in uh, Aguajun, it's one of the strongest nations in the Peruvian Amazon. Here they are. Very autonomous, extraordinary. I am so, I learned so much from them. And then an alternative to uh, create uh, an audience that will read the language. Even if people are not used to read the language, then if you put a sign, this is, for example, signaling of um, an area. It's a, it's a, like a lake, sacred area for the Mije in Mexico. And they erase the, the, the sign in Spanish and they put it in, in Mije. This is happening in Peru, in the area of, of um, Puno. Uh, you have Quechua, uh, Aymara, 
and Spanish, trilingual signaling. Guarani, uh, Guarani is a, is, a, is a language that is official in Paraguay. Yeah, although, you know, Guarani is, is spoken largely, a lot of bilingual people in, they, the, the people that speak Guarani as a native language are usually the poor. I also put some things that happen in Wales. Public signs are important, no? You can look at this a little bit more. It's in, you can keep the, and you can reproduce my, my PowerPoint with no problem. <laughs> can use it to in your classes. Language is the carrier of culture and memory. To starve or kill a language is to starve and kill a people's memory bank. Ngubi Wasiongo is my professor. And I'm going to end with this. For the silent languages, this is my dedication. No? for the languages that are pressured towards decline in 2019. And now we're gonna have the decade of indigenous language, year of language justice. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ben bir soru sorabilirim. Yes, sure. Ee, çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Ee, öncelikle böyle bir e, bizim için böyle bir sunum yaptığı için imanıma. Ee, ben bu Keçua dilinden bahsetti çoğunlukla e, o dilin konuşulduğu e, yerlerden. Ben buradaki Hı -hı aktivizmleri merak ediyorum. Yani e, o bölgede e, dil haklarını savunmak adına topluluklar nasıl Hı -hı. E, aktivizmler yapıyorlar? Teşekkür ederim. I think there are there are that's why I show the photos. There are people who are defending the language. But there is still a lot of shame and a lot of uh, people are afraid, you know, to speak the language. One thing is to come out and defend it uh, in, you know, debates. But the reality is that the only way to defend the language is to speak it everywhere. And that is still very far away, you know. The uh, Spanish is completely um it, it's it's like a block not only peru all over latin america i think the spaniards when they invaded uh, the americas they left the language very it's very Im embedded and there is little of what people can do really about that. I am, um, I think what people do is resist um, without confronting, but the intergenerational, um, uh, the, the passing of the language through other generations is becoming very slow. That's why we are spoken, we are a language spoken by millions, but we are still in the endangered language list. Uh, I don't see uh, a lot of youth um, becoming language defenders. I think it is improving, but it's slow. In Bolivia, it's completely different. In Bolivia, I think the defense not only of Aymara, but Quechua is very strong. The same thing in Ecuador, you know? There are reasons for that, but That would be Lord, long to explain. Mm -hmm. Any question? I, I, well, I, <laughs> I have questions. <laughs> uh, um, 
Okay. Now, I know that there are some films made in indigenous languages. I was wondering if they receive any funding from the government and if the indigenous people uh, show interest in these films. Thank oh, you. yes. Um, it is that that's the problem that sometimes is poisoned. <laughs> they, they receive the money, but it's poisoned. <laughs> because they uh, provide money uh, through the ministries, no? Ministry of Education and Ministry of Culture, but they tell you what to do, how to do it. And I think that's why, for example, in, in education, we have the tradition of bilingual education. But as I said before, bilingual education is basically they photocopy what's been going on in the United States, they bring it here and it doesn't work. Let me give you an example. Bilingual education was given uh, the, okay, more than 60 years, 70 years ago. And they, their focus has been to write in Quechua. Writing, 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 using the alphabet, the Roman alphabet, writing. People don't write that much, you know. Now, poetry, it's going on, or the signaling. That means that people are not appropri appropriating that way of communication. So we need to look into it, no? And also the bilingual education methodology is based on transitional. It's basically using Quechua in, in the classroom, but only until elementary school. And then in high school, it's only Spanish. So a lot of inconsistencies. Mm -hmm. That's, there are, um, there's policy, no, to supposedly start programs to revitalize the languages or to, you know, have uh, indigenous communities develop uh, their own industries. But again, uh, it's not necessarily what the communities decide to do, but what they are being told to do, no? Ben bir şey sormak istiyorum. Ee, yayıncılık e, faaliyetleri var mı? Örneğin televizyon, radyo yayını ya da basılı yayın, kitap yayını, dergi gibi. Keçua dilinde. Uh, we don't have publishing houses. There are a few, I think last year was the first time in that uh, a Quechua writer produced, um, was published a novel that was entirely written in, in Quechua that you could go and buy it in the supermarket, for example. But I know that many people buy it just like an object, <laughs> but they don't really read it. You see, that's one thing. The second one, yes, we have broadcasting. The, the law that was approved contemplated strongly on the importance of having a TV channel dedicated only to indigenous people, languages. But they didn't do it, of course. They uh, they are never going to allow that budget. Pero uh, is they well, it's a third world country. However, they approved for a news program that is aired at 6 a.m. in the morning. 6 a.m. in the morning for half an hour. But there is controversy, and let me tell you what it is. This is going to. Um, I think show how complex is the situation of Quechua. Quechua has a lot of dialects, a lot of variations of the language. There are two main, let's say, groups. One is the Southern Peruvian Quechua, 
that is the most used because Machu Picchu is around there, Cusco, you know, and um, it's the one that is always the the how can, in the eye of the government because it's very much used for the folklorist postcard <laughs> for tourism. But there is the Northern Quechua, which is what my mom spoke, called Central Quechua. And some of the Central Quechua dialects are not that intelligible with the Southern Peruvian Quechua. Even within the Southern Peruvian Quechua, there are very different uh, dialects. But the, the government has selected only one dialect called the Chanka Ayacucho uh, dialect. So for me, if we have a news uh, program, it's just promoting one variation, which is creating a lot of problems because number one, some people look at it and say, I don't understand what they're saying. And other people think, oh, like my mom, no, she used to look at the, at the news uh, program and say, Oh, that's the real Quechua. You see, my Quechua is not, is not the good one. So look at what they're doing. The state doesn't understand the Quechua world at all. Some Quechua speakers are allowing themselves to be used like that. And what, it, what is happening is that a, a supra dialect is coming out. You know, like this is the correct one and you've, you've had to speak like me, otherwise, and that connects to writing, forget it. Very difficult situation. Yeah, so I think the idea is to understand that you cannot create language policies for languages using a monocultural, monolingual approach. You need to truly think on diversity, you know, and a news program should be rotating. One, let's say three months should be conducted by this group of people, other three months by this other group of, you know, dialect speakers from different parts. There are even Quechua speakers in the Amazon. They are not even counted. And their dialect is not necessarily the same as the one that is being promoted by the state. So that's creating division. You see, it's not that easy. At the beginning, it was uh, a huge um, sense of pride, no? But obviously we, we have and different dialects, different variations of the language and everyone has the right to be counted, no? So that's, that's the situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there are any questions, we can take them. Mm -hmm. I suppose. Could, um, could you talk a little bit more about the elementary um, education, um, how, um, you know, uh, Quechua instruction plays into it? Um, is it like a secondary language or uh, I'm really puzzled about, you know, the positive effects of um, Yeah, there, there are many language. Yeah, there, there are, um, there have been a development of, of how these the Quechua language has been treated in the elementary school. Uh, over the years, they have switched from one methodology to the other. Mm -hmm. In general, what they try to do is to uh, teach literacy in both languages, mm -hmm. but the language of instruction has mainly been Spanish. Oh. Okay. Although the kids really, many of them, you know, don't really speak um, a lot of Spanish when they show up in schools. It also depends on the degree of urbanization, semi-urban or rural. If the school is rural, I think they basically hire local teachers. Mm -hmm. But there is a problem here, which is how do you write a language that has not been, um, that, has, that doesn't have a tradition? 
mm -hmm. of writing in alphabetic systems. So that's where I think there have been a lot of issues and problems between using syllabic method or global methods and um, so writing in itself is like an, an, a different tradition. And I understand there is a video that I can send to you that um, I think it's one of the most, uh, is very clear on how sometimes many parents from the most traditional communities um, decide not to send their kids to, to regular school. You know, Why not? And, uh, because they feel that the kid is not learning really how to read and write uh, in Spanish well. He's mm -hmm. also not learning how to read and write well in Quechua. So he's basic, and he's also turning, turning himself or herself in someone who's very um, selfish oriented. Mm -hmm. So that I think there has been some real problems with the training of teachers, mm -hmm. but especially with the goals of the methodologies of how are they going to introduce the mm -hmm. uh, written version of the class in the native language. Mm -hmm. So much as to, for example, when they finish the four or the, the fourth of the fifth grade of primary school in which they go into high school, they stopped writing in Quechua at all. It looks like if those years of learning how to read and write in Quechua mm -hmm. were of no use to the child in such mm -hmm. a way that they only in some ways are forced to use it at school, limited mm -hmm. in a limited way, but the reality is that what they do is they basically switch into Spanish mm -hmm. Uh, they start to let go of Quechua and they learn how to read and write in Spanish more than in, they would do in the first language. So I think the goals have been very, very fuzzy. No? Mm -hmm. That's at least what I observe from the outside. No? But the, the state doesn't say that. They say that they've made huge um, achievements and I think there is a dislocation there that's still, and I think, you know what, I, I think it has to do with the consultation of the communities. If, mm -hmm. this, if those schools are autonomously uh, conducted by the community's decision and the community receives um, training, but out of their own will, I think things would probably turn into a different way, no? But in 60 years, they have not created a corpus of students who were trained to read and write in Quechua, and they are now readers or writers. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I, would, I have a follow-up question. Um, sure. Like, for example, um, how many hours of um, Quechua instruction um, is in schools, in elementary schools? Um, I think that is, that is now, uh, it, go, it changes a lot from region to region. Yeah. Depending on how much, this is the, the situation. Many teachers to be employed need to pass an exam. And the results show that many of them feel very insecure in their Quechua skills, mm -hmm. oral or written, and also in their Spanish skills, oral yeah. or written. Mm -hmm. So from the get-go, you have a teacher who's entering the system with mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, imbalances, and mm -hmm. to, the system is not responding. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what we have been doing in the past four months in, uh, through the university that I am associated in Lima, trying to tell the teachers that they need to um, truly, now that we are on long distance, you know, teaching and learning, no? Mm -hmm. To focus more hours during the, during the school day 
in the Quechua language, but they avoid it. They, there is this sort of, how can I say, echo forces mm -hmm. that tell that the, the teacher is picking up that the child is mostly going to be evaluated in their Spanish skills, written and oral, not in the Quechua language. So mm -hmm. they are sort of neglecting it. And look what they tell, that they tell us. They say that the parents don't want their children to be taught in Quechua. Parents so what? Parents don't want their children to be taught in Quechua. Mm -hmm. um, Quechua parents? Quechua parents. Yeah. That's what so they say. That's huh. what they say. But I think, I, they don't say it, I think, because they... They don't like. They don't want their children to speak the language. I think there is a. The the environment is telling them that schooling is not going to. That schooling in Quechua is not going to help the future of their children. That schooling is basically part of Western. You know, yeah. they don't feel it's their school. They feel it's this other society yeah. mainstream, and Quechua yeah. should stay here at home. It's it's a it's a tough uh, yeah yes. it's tough. Um, well, um, I would imagine that you know since um, a, a, a Quechua language has um, been um, given the official status, I would imagine that you know a, maybe part of the um, uh, part of the struggle uh, would be to. Um, um, to make Spanish speakers um, uh, be bilingual, just as Quechua speakers exactly. would yeah, be that's bilingual. That's exactly what, yeah, what we advocate for. But yeah, because right now it seems like it's a secondary um, language in elementary school, and then and you don't have it at all afterwards. And and, and it's not ex non-existence in high school. Yeah, and at the university, people are talking in the bathroom. <laughs> Oh, I they see. don't talk outside. Yeah. So I, you know, I sometimes I'm sitting there saying, oh my God. And sometimes if I address people in Quechua, they feel very uncomfortable. Of so course. over the four years that I was, I came back from New York, no, the in 2016. Um I've learned to sort of uh, accommodate myself so that I won't be rejected or this crazy lunatic, you know, Quechua that comes from New York that's going to tell me what to do. I mean, I I just try to adjust, but I see that the shame and the and the, um, uh, the prejudice is mm -hmm. still there. It hasn't yeah. changed at all. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's the idea. The idea is not only that the Quechua will learn Spanish, but uh, that the Spanish-speaking mainstream people would start to learn Quechua seriously, not as a joke, not, not as a fetish, oh, this is so beautiful, no, no, yeah. no, as a regular language. That is, it has the same properties, that it could span vocabulary, that it could adopt, that it has science behind, that is not still in the, in the mentality of yeah, all absolutely. Latin America, in all yeah. Latin America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be a worthwhile uh, struggle, especially in urban areas uh, where, um, you know, um, students come from uh, both backgrounds. Uh, I mean, the situation might be different in a rural area where um, only Quechua speaker kids are in school, but mm -hmm. in urban areas, it could be worthwhile to um, uh, kind of uh, encourage, even force Spanish speaking students to take Quechua classes. I yeah, that's been, that, 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 that has been um, a proposal of having mandatory uh, classes of yeah. Quechua, but then we have to choose which variety of Quechua are we going to choose, and then it becomes oh, complicated. Yeah. There is fight within, and uh, but it hasn't been approved, and I don't know if it will work. Maybe it will, I don't know, but I think the fact that the country is so full of, of um, Quechua people, it should really, uh, there has to be a way to make an equilibrium, no? Yeah. This is still a struggle. I think we were doing a little bit better um, five, four years ago, but now 
with the new government and also with the pandemic situation, yeah. things have really are really very yeah. difficult right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Miriam, it seems like we all have very common problems. Mm -hmm. We, as you were talking, and you said um, my mother's language was hidden. Literally, my heart burned <laughs> because I really felt for it. Um, we unfortunately we came uh, to the end of this uh, session. Mm -hmm. uh, with our interpreter as well. It has been very, very nice to listen to you. And I didn't even know that there were different dialects of Kecha and it yes. has been very informative, extremely. And um, well, we would like to learn more about your languages, about indigenous languages, and perhaps mm -hmm. we could organize another session all together absolutely absolutely yeah. i would love to and i would love to when this pandemic situation maybe for next year i really would like to find a way to go there and then we can have um, a presentation in istanbul because it's, it's one of my it's one of my dreams in the world to be you know that part of the world is so rich and we so we know so little about it Mm -hmm. I would love to learn more about the last. I was reading an article in Spanish that's come out in Global yeah. Voices. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would love to. I would love to interview maybe so some happy. of you and, and, and publish something so people would know here and also in North America, you know, because I do have a lot of contact with North American Indian. Mm -hmm. Oof, I because I lived in, in the North for so long. No? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's great. Yeah. Thank you very much to you no, and to our audience honor. and also, also to our amazing interpreter here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if I was too fast. And you can use my PowerPoint in any way you, you would like. You can share Thank it you. to everyone and they can yeah. look at it. If they have any questions, you have my um, email address. I love to be in contact. Thank okay. you very much. We will be publishing this. Uh, it will be on YouTube anyway. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a Take good care. day. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.